Today, I'm excited to share with you a brand new weekly series that I'm going to be rolling into the uh, usual podcast lineup, implementing some stoic ideas and philosophy into things. I've been getting a lot of requests in the comments and in different places around that. So hey, let's give it a shot, right? Let's start with today, six things you should do every morning, according to the Stoics. I've obviously been a huge advocate of maximizing your morning routine. It creates momentum, kind of sets you up for the whole day. Now, the unique thing about that is it doesn't need to be anything specific or particular. You know, as the great Charlie Munger said, you are your own experiment. Understand what you like, what lights you up, and move towards that. There is no one-size-fits-all. However, I did find these stoic guidelines to be incredibly helpful, particularly in gaining perspective. So that said, here are six things you should do every morning according to the Stoics. Number one is take time to reflect on what you can control. Seneca famously said, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. You know that feeling when you're stressed, your heart rate's elevated a little bit. Sometimes you can't even point to why, right? You're just overwhelmed. I think it's beneficial to start your day by identifying what's within your control and what's not, because doing so sets a tone of empowerment and focus. It shrinks that big, overwhelming world down and makes it feel manageable. It reminds you, hey, you can exhaust energy on, you name it, weather or outside events or things that happened yesterday. You can do that all day long. But guess what? You can't change those things. Empowerment is highlighting the few things you can control. And I recently saw someone draw uh, on a whiteboard a giant circle. They said, this is life. And then within that, drew a little circle and said, these are the things you actually have control over. So focus on your little circle. Own it. Cherish it. One of my favorite quotes is, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. It's by Tolstoy. You cannot control outside events, but you can control you. And if you take the time to understand that and to really hone in on the things you can change, you empower yourself. That's how you change the world. Number two, every morning practice gratitude. Epictetus has said, He is a wise man who does not grieve for the things which he has not, but rejoices for those which he has. I used to see this as certainly a nice thing, but a little fluffy, right? Not imperative. Kind of like, eh, okay, sure, be thankful. But what I've come to learn is the power in taking time every day to look around and acknowledge the things uh, that we often take for granted. The things that have just become so expected you know, we're so immersed in them that we cease to appreciate them. Now, I reference every once in a while the migraines I get as a precious reminder, ironically enough, to appreciate the absence of pain. Right? Like, normally, who looks around and thinks, yes, I'm not in pain today. What a treat. What a gift to be alive. We need to find that perspective. Gratitude is a reminder not to wait until things are taken or gone to appreciate them. It's, it's acknowledging them now. Create something to contrast life's little inconveniences against. Sure, X happened, and X is not ideal. It's annoying and uncomfortable. But look around. Look at all you do have, because you have it pretty good. And being armed with that perspective is a gift. Number three, every morning meditate on your mortality, also known as memento mori. And this is focusing on the impermanence of life to truly hone in on and capitalize on the present moment, to appreciate the now. Seneca has said, let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. In a way, similar to gratitude, one before on the list, this creates a very powerful perspective. We aren't here forever. And very rarely do we take the time to acknowledge that impermanence. Why hold anything back? 
Why play small? Why not delve fully into who you are and what matters? Again, we are but a raindrop in a thunderstorm. So make the most of the journey. Number four, every morning set realistic goals for the day. Focus on what can actually be achieved. As Epictetus has said, if you wish to be a writer, then write. And this ties into the first idea I mentioned about focusing on what you can control. Very similar concept. Every day, create targets for yourself that you can hit. Manufacture obstacles that you can overcome. There's nothing better than going to bed at night knowing you accomplished everything you set out to accomplish. When you do that, you start to identify as someone who succeeds, who faces obstacles and overcomes. But this means learning to break the big things down into that which is actionable. Right, to continue on from Epictetus's quote, you can't write a book in a day, but you can set the expectation for yourself that you'll write five pages. That's actionable. That not only pushes you forward, but contributes to your identity as a high performer. It helps you build momentum. Great things come from a willingness to break big dreams down into actionable steps and carry them out. Number five, every morning cultivate resilience. Reflect on uh, past difficulties and how you've overcome them. Epictetus wrote, the greater the difficulty, the more glory in surmounting it. Sometimes we do so much looking forward that we forget to look back. As pointed out by uh, Dan Sullivan in a, in a great book called The Gap and the Gain, the ideal is a target always out of reach. It's always far away. And if that's all we see, then we will never be enough. But when we compare ourselves to who we were yesterday, we're reminded of our resilience. We're shown the things we've overcome to get to the now. Because look, you've had many difficulties before today. Plenty of hard times. And the fact that you're standing here means, in some capacity, you've triumphed over all of it. Don't forget that that ability lives within you. That you are stronger than you think and more capable than you can even imagine. And lastly, number six, practice kindness and empathy. As Seneca has said, wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for kindness. This goes a long way, not only in the contentment it will bring to you personally, but in the ability to make the world a better place, to feel like you're contributing to something bigger. Kindness is a superpower, it's a strength and it always has a way of coming right back to you. So being that it costs nothing to be kind and that the impact of doing so is uh, clear and so valuable, it's worth the time to think about how you can bring that light to yourself and others. It will change your life and it will change the world around you. There's a Latin phrase pronounced amor fati. It's one of the more powerful ideas I've come across. Its translation means love of fate. It implies everything that happens is good, or at the very least necessary. And I think we need that reminder from time to time because funny enough, it is one of the first sentiments to leave us when we're in trouble when we're down or lost. The idea that everything has its value. And sure, we don't always understand it in the moment or when we're fighting through it, but that circumstance or even tragedy in the great play of life has a crucial role. Someone recently sent me a beautiful clip from a Stephen Colbert interview. And I want to dive in, but 
There's a caveat. I ask that you listen to this in a vacuum. For our purposes, I'm not going to be the Stephen Colbert who mocks half the country on live TV every night. This is the wise Stephen Colbert with a lot of value to add because he can be both. To frame the interview, he's sitting across from Anderson Cooper, and Anderson's asking him about something he said a while back. Anderson reads the quote, I've learned to love the things I'd most wished had not happened. What punishments of God are not gifts? Anderson then looks up from the paper, looks over at Stephen, and asks, Do you really believe that? To which Stephen responds, Yes. It's a gift to exist, and with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. You can't pick and choose what to be grateful for. A truly incredible emotional moment. It is the realization of Amor Fati. Even the most trying of times are a bridge to something. Even that which is taken away creates a space for one to ultimately find what they need. A couple years ago, I did a, a keynote in Hollywood Beach talking about those difficult situations. Some of them are external, but some of them we create. Right? Chaos, self-induced, that opens the door to the most precious of occurrences. Things that I never would have had or arrived at if not for the pain, the sadness, the confusion. It truly all fits together. And so I basically take a trip down memory lane, talking about the physical duress of a cold morning run, wouldn't you know it, strengthens one's conviction and belief in themselves. Or the sadness in leaving someone you care about, someone you love, knowing it's no longer what's best for either of you, but was necessary. Touched on the fear, the physical resistance I felt walking onto stages in 2015 and 16, dreaming of off-ramps, thinking of excuses in my head all the way up until the mic was in my hand on stage and words came out of my mouth that propelled me to comfort and confidence in sharing my voice. Again, it's all one big puzzle. Every piece matters. You don't get ups without downs. And as you push forward into the next thing and the next, as you see the breadth of the unexpected and the power of the unknown, you learn. You learn that the so-called lows aren't the exception. They're not a problem to be solved. And as I sit here now, I even view them less as a cost than I once did, a pain that must be endured. No, it's all worthy and deserving of our gratitude. It all matters, it's all precious. I talked about, on a recent episode, getting migraines. And one of the days I remember more than any other in my life, and, and I'm 36 now by the time this episode's released, I have a few days under my belt. This one was truly memorable to me. I was having a debilitating headache and a ton of pain, finally able to fall asleep. And I remember waking up, opening my eyes and realizing that the night had finally slipped by. Morning arrived and I felt good again. And I slowly got up, kind of tilted my head back and forth, testing the waters, all clear. I walked outside down to the beach, and as the sun came up, I sat on the lifeguard stand and just looked out in awe. The sand, the waves, the seagulls, the sky, it all meant more in that moment than it ever had. I was just beyond grateful to be there. And, and so you talk about the lows being gifts. You know, I get it, it's, it sounds cliche at best, maybe even ridiculous. 
But those lows, I swear by it, always seem to give me the things I'm most grateful for. It's a pattern that constantly repeats itself. They always remind me that the magic is the stuff I walk right by. They put me in hell for a period of time so that I understand to exist beyond that space is a mirror. Without lows, life's beauty becomes a baseline. When something is a baseline, it's definitionally average or regular, it's mundane. I've learned to love all the things I'd most wished had not happened. What punishments of God are not gifts? It all matters. It all brings you something. And if you're at a point where you're so deep in the weeds or so far in the trenches that you've forgotten, I hope this finds you and lifts you above it all. I hope it reminds you that you will arrive at the place you most need to be. And it will be not despite, but because of this path you walked, that you arrived there. Some people live their entire lives waiting for miracles. Some people realize they're already in one and act accordingly. I hope today you choose the latter because it is a gift to be here. Reality is a mirror, reflecting back at you not the world as it is, but the world as you are. The idea here is that if you don't pause and remind yourself how much control you have over your own reality, over what you're seeing, you start thinking you're at the mercy of someone else's story, a character in a play that is not your own. You forget that in your own movie, you're the scriptwriter. Or as Marcus Aurelius wrote, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. I recently heard this referred to as the mirror principle. But really, for obvious reasons, I'm more partial to calling it your world within. An echo of Tolstoy's classic line, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And that is where our power lies. Or using the same example, you can't change the reflection you see by shaking the mirror. You change the reflection by changing your relationship with yourself by changing how you treat and view yourself. Which not only alters your actions, it alters how the world views you. One of the first things we notice about someone is whether they are confident, whether they operate with conviction and self-belief. We notice how they view themselves immediately. The greatest gifts I've been given from, you know, mentors and people I look up to in life, they haven't been material. No, they've always been subtle reminders that I set the guidelines and the world conforms. It's always been, hey, Eddie, if you only view yourself as someone who charges a little bit of money to clients, that's how potential clients will view you. Eddie, if you surround yourself with people who think small, that's exactly what you'll become accustomed to doing. Eddie, if you don't believe you can do amazing things, P. 
people won't walk up to you and believe it for you. All of these have been reminders that the reflections that I'd created for myself at those points in time were limiting. The reflection I was allowing was narrow in scope. It was safe. It was small. And if I wanted more, it wasn't up to the world. It certainly wasn't a matter of crossing my fingers and hoping that that mirror would randomly tell a different story. It was seeing myself as someone who creates a new picture altogether. And that can be a difficult thing to grasp, right? Like, you can't change the mirror at all. You can only change what you bring to the mirror. So what are some examples? What are some pieces in the past that I've worked on? One, first and foremost, imposter syndrome. One of the cool things about having speeches blow up on YouTube before I ever gave a keynote speech on stage is that I started getting invites to speak all over the place. The flip side to that is that I felt like someone who didn't belong there. It happened too quickly. It was outside the comfort of my studio. It was like, oh no, the, the world's gonna find me out. And that's what I brought to the mirror. And of course, for a while, that's exactly what the mirror showed right back. I had to convince myself that I could speak anywhere through practice, through affirmation, trudging through the mud of doubt and uncertainty and earning a different reflection. I say that not to pat myself on the back, but to demonstrate a battle fought mostly in private where I had to rewire how I saw not the world, but myself, how I saw my ability to navigate seemingly insurmountable things. It always amazes me how so much of any battle is merely confronting it with confidence. It's knowing that, hey, difficult or not, I belong here and I'm going to figure it out. That's what I do. I think we all need to find a way to bring that to our personal mirrors. And again, it'll feel weird. Good. It'll feel inauthentic at first. Perfect. Change requires a breaking down and building up, and breaking down never feels good. Now, I can give you another example and I think this will certainly be relatable to most of you. Not being able to see the gratitude in my life over the small annoyances, right? like something stupid or not ideal or disruptive, would just prompt this spiral. And my uh, Facebook getting hacked is a great example of this. I've talked about this before. My world ended for a few hours. Right? I was so angry until I got it together and composed myself. It's like, Eddie, you need to be the type of person who observes, who calmly collects the data and then makes a productive decision. Now, clearly I wasn't that, right? And in many ways I'm still working towards it. But I know that's part of the reflection I want. That's something I'm working towards every day. And you know what's helped me? Gratitude. Seriously, that's simple. Three things in the morning I feel grateful for. People I have in my life, things I get to do, the work that I love, whatever it is that day, you know, I, I write it down. Because just thinking that way elevates my baseline to not just existing, but realizing how lucky I am. And I, I start from a place not of lack, but of abundance. And that puts things into perspective so that when, you know, things do go wrong or the wheels do fall off the wagon, it's not the end of the world. It's one little trial or tribulation in the great play of your life, one that you're very happy to be in. And I could go on and on, right? Whether we want to call this the mirror principle or the creating of your world within or just merely obtaining perspective. The idea is simple. What the reflection shows you 
is directly correlated to the things you've accepted or allowed in your life. And if you don't like the view, well then adjust what you're allowing. Give yourself permission to level up, to be more, take more risks, to chase down the upside. Reality is a mirror. And a mirror is an output. You are the input. You are where it all begins, where everything in your world takes shape. So give yourself permission to fight for a reflection that you're proud of. Just imagine if we implemented into our lives all those things we already knew would make us better. Imagine if we became masters, not just of knowing, but of transforming knowledge into motion. A friend of mine, Tyler, will reach out every once in a while after listening to uh, one of the episodes, and we'll just kind of riff back and forth on the content chat about the overlaps, the differences, most importantly, you know, how we can each in our own world be a little better, happier, and healthier. Tyler recently built and sold a tech company and is now transitioning into a new chapter of his life. And in essence, starting over, which is something uh, I can in many ways relate to. And this morning I got a voice note and said, man, Imagine if we implemented wholeheartedly the things we knew to be true. Imagine if we could execute for ourselves with the same advice that's so obvious when looking out at the world, at others. And I thought, oh man, right? as someone who spent a decade thinking and philosophizing about this stuff, this is a, a very real and valuable question. Not only that, sort of comes at a perfect time. And here's why. Right? Those of you who have been listening to the channel or podcast for a long time, you know this, for me, has been one great adventure. Documentation of a journey. Starting with the first video I ever released, Ode to Excellence, which was essentially me promising myself just to give this creator thing a try and not go back to what I knew to be safe. To videos like Running in the Rain, where I discuss my coming to understand the value of identifying as a person who does the hard thing, to speeches like, make you proud, where all I'm really doing is during hard times, assuring myself that things will be fine. To more recently, where sure, I'm finally seeing some of that growth and 10 years of effort compounding, uh, but now grappling with brand new challenges. Right, since day one, I've been coaching myself through the ups and the downs, but. What are these stories? What do they provide for me or for those who listen to them? Well, in a sense, they're the lessons learned. They paint a portrait of the ideal. They're merely information. Yes, life gives you more when you ask more of life. And yes, discomfort is often the cost of admission. Yes, you can get through life's greatest storms if you take it one step at a time. And yes, the challenges we face evolve and the context changes, but we are equipped to confront and handle them. Guess what though? None of that information matters if we don't act on it. If we're not using the past to recreate the present. Those stories are my map. But even the best map in the world is meaningless unless it's being utilized. And Tyler's very simple and direct question was valuable to me in that it did two things. First, it made me think, Eddie, look back at your journey. Look what you've overcome, right? In a number of ways, you've learned. You know what needs to now be done and simultaneously prompted me to ask. And so now, this very moment, what are you doing 
about it. I love the lesson. I think there's art in our struggle and beauty in the overcoming of our suffering. But if all those lessons, if the ideal remains stagnant like a caged bird, what's the point? That wisdom must be set free, and that only happens with a targeted, deliberate effort. I felt this uh, sense of excitement, invigoration in asking myself, how can I highlight the doing? Where can those wheels hit the road faster? How can I delve further into those very epiphanies I love to explore? Something that I'm encountering now that's both fun and challenging is the transformation from, I mean, really being a solo creator, speaking, writing, producing in his studio, to seeing the process as a business owner, to building a support structure and systematizing workflows, right? As a, as a friend has said to me before, a little less Mickey Mouse in order to be a little more Walt Disney. And it's happening, but the truth is, right? You don't get where you're going the same way you arrived where you are. So how can the old lessons be turned into action now? Knowing my world changes the second I decide to act is like having an unused arsenal at my disposal. Knowing my foot is barely touching the pedal is power. And we can all focus on that actualization of our knowledge. We can all ask, what's one thing I can do today that I need to, I know that I need to, that perhaps I wouldn't have, but didn't give myself a little push. I love the idea of that simple diagram where you draw a line straight down a page and on the left side, you're listing your current obstacles, the things that are really bothering you or the reasons you're stuck. And then on the right, one single thing you're gonna do about it. All it does is reinforce action and action is everything. Because to Tyler's point, you know, I really know what needs to be done. We all really know what needs to be done. Not how things will end or maybe what the finish line looks like, but we know now we have a gut sense of what we need to do and where the opportunity lies. We're aware, we understand. So a world where we become masters of doing is a world where we transform beyond our wildest imagination. And the things I talk about, they can ultimately in my life become everything or wither away into nothing. They can sit there as a supposed to, an ideal, and ultimately a, I wish I did. All that depends on what I do with it and how I choose to act when I'm uncomfortable, moving into a new space. The same can be said for anyone listening to this. You're equipped with at least a starting point. You probably know what you don't like. You're probably aware uh, of some things that must be eliminated or left behind. But knowing that is only as good as your first step. So are you willing to partake in the doing? In taking the little pieces of wisdom and breathing life into them by walking out your front door? By looking in the mirror and trusting in your ability to adapt, to change, to grow in a world of complexity? Let's simplify. We know what must be done, so let's focus on the doing. And on the journey, if we misstep or miss the mark, adjust and move again. Because we know there's nothing more tragic than doing nothing at all. Right? Do something today that takes an ax to the tree of stagnation. Not everything, but one thing. When you are in motion, that world seems to conform to rearrange around you. So here's to giving life the opportunity to make that happen, to giving yourself the opportunity to experience it. As Tyler stated, just imagine if we implemented wholeheartedly the things we knew to be true, not kind of or sort of, but with the same or greater intensity and in many cases intentionality it took to acquire the knowledge. What would that look like? Let's move now.
Let's swing away. Let's uncover that world where your lessons translate to feet on the pavement and reality in the palm of your hand. We are the stories we tell ourselves. I used to tell the maybe someday story until I saw the value contained in the why not today story. I was a main character in the how do I not mess things up story until I pushed my way into the how about capturing life's upside story. I believed wholeheartedly in the what will my friends, acquaintances, people I used to know think of me story before I felt the freedom of the you don't live life for them, you live life for you story. My scarcity story preceded my abundance story. My bowing before the odds story preceded my simply do not stop story. My you don't deserve them story preceded my if you're not a net positive on my life, I don't want you around story. My maybe I can be that impact add that much value, make that much money, have that much fun story, preceded my, I'm going to do all those things. Now how do I arrange these pieces to support my mission story? As I've grown and learned and changed, so of the stories that I've told myself, and I can look back and always draw a direct line from the stories I was telling and the life I was living. We get in life what we allow and our narratives, our stories happen to be the gatekeepers. If you want to change the situation, change the story, right? If you're telling yourself the world is against you, you'll live like the world is against you. If you're telling yourself the world is conspiring to help you live your best, you'll find the opportunity where you otherwise would. And you'll find it not through magic, but because you're looking for it. It's that simple. We don't look for things that go against our narratives. We don't seek things out that we don't believe exist. Those internal stories prompt our action, and our action changes our reality. Since finding this a few weeks ago, it's become one of my favorite ideas. Alan Watts, speaking to a classroom of students, he says, when a flag is flapping in the wind, is it the wind or the flag that moves? Neither. It is the mind that moves. Our minds are moving, they are internalizing and painting the portrait that becomes our reality. If you don't like the reality you're seeing, guess what? It's not the world, it's how you're viewing the world. It's what you're doing about your world. And I understand how hard it can get, how we all oscillate between periods of struggle and contentment, how low the lows can feel, I get it. But the truth is the wrong stories will simply keep you down, hold you there. They'll ensure blinders stay on as life rotates around you and the opportunity dissipates. We are the stories we tell ourselves. And that's beautiful news because it means the reflection in the mirror holds the key to transformation. Life can give you the details, the context, but it can't write the script. That, my friend, is all you.
The other day, I was sitting in Miami traffic, looking out the window, and it dawned on me. How interesting that human beings haven't solved for this. Like, this is a major annoyance in a lot of people's lives. Now, we put human beings on a rocket ship. We've navigated them beyond the Earth's atmosphere. We've landed them on the moon, but still are unable to effectively get around between 4 and 7 p.m. on weekdays. It's just kind of interesting to realize. Now, there are very practical reasons for this, sure. Not to mention people studying and invested in the problem. And I think most noteworthy, I'm not even saying one is more valuable than another. This is merely a thought experiment. We get the results where we place our attention. We valued going to the moon. Because of this, humans walked on the literal moon. And we're so used to this having happened uh, that its shock value isn't quite there, right? But for a species who 100 years ago was traveling by horse and buggy, uh, it's pretty impressive. And I just think it's a, a cool reminder that where we place our focus is where we'll get our positive results. We can change everything if we place a spotlight on it. That begs the question, where are you placing your spotlight? As John Maxwell said, nobody ever uh, went up a hill on accident. There was intentionality, which gave life to focus and action, planning, growth. We only evolve where we shine that spotlight, or as I've said in previous episodes or videos, what you water grows. I've certainly spent my fair share of time angry uh, annoyed by things that I've, by no coincidence, given zero effort to fixing. Now, when, when you do nothing to solve a problem, all you can cling to is the ability to complain about it. If you're not putting energy and resources there, you most likely won't win. Some of the best advice I got from a friend a few years back was uh, to highlight the things that matter to you and measure them because this allows you to be aware, to be intentional with your action. It's deciding which handful of things are going to be your quote unquote moon landing and then watching over them like they are precious. Now let's say a goal of yours is to increase your net worth. If you're looking at your bank account every day, you're much more likely to make better monetary decisions than someone who keeps their finances in the dark because they hate thinking about it. There are deliberate actions that must take place to bring about that change. When I look at, say, YouTube, I tend to know a substantial amount about my metrics because I really care about the channel and its growth and its impact. I watch it and I monitor it. Things dip, I need to know why. If they took a sudden uh, upswing and they're great, I need to know why. If success on a platform is my metaphorical moon landing, I'm locked into every up and down. I have to understand what's going on so I can make the necessary adjustments to grow. And then when the growth happens after time has elapsed, I can think, in my own little world, that was space travel. I was driving that metaphorical horse and buggy not all that long ago. But I stayed locked in. And this may seem simple, and it is. But for what it's worth, my biggest breakthroughs always tend to be. I've exhausted a lot of energy, and in some cases even paid uh, you know, a decent amount of money to learn the simple things. Nothing is that complicated. We just think it is. Which is why we do nothing and then complain about the delta between the real and the ideal. But I'm here to tell you that if you decide on a few things that matter to you and then measure their progress, allocate the energy to moving along with them, where you'll be in months or years from now will astound you. It will be breathtaking. But you have to be willing to peel back the curtain and immerse yourself in it. Prove to yourself 
that sure, it might feel big and complex, but once you give something that time and attention, it becomes clear pretty quickly how simple it all is. What's one thing you can do every day in each meaningful category in your life that will get you closer to where you want to be? If you watch over that process and you adjust along the way, the amount of opportunity available, the amount of change you'll create is unbelievable. And someday to others on the outside looking in, your progress will seem out of this world larger than life. It will appear a moon landing. But you'll know it wasn't the miraculous, it was just a simple decision to give it time and attention. You watered it, and so it grew. Here's a mental shift that's provided me with some clarity, particularly when things don't happen right away. As we all know, the good things don't. Validation is stubborn. It'll take its time. So positioning for that, putting yourself in the right mental state as you chip away is huge. And the idea is every day you move forward, it's not about the revolutionary, life-altering change in the now. It's about the continuous building up and positioning of oneself for an opportunity to come. In other words, the monumental opportunity is out there. It does exist. And you will inevitably cross paths with it. The question is, Will you have grown as a person? Will your skills have been sufficiently developed? Will your overall competency have been elevated enough so that you're ready to receive it when you do? That's the thing about opportunities. They only matter if we put ourselves in position to receive them and part of what motivates me every day is the fact that I'm chipping away at those opportunities to come at some point in the future. Opportunities I can't even, you know, understand or fathom in the moment. But the reason I'll be able to capitalize on them is because of today's groundwork. And that's the point here. That's often when life feels heavy, what pushes me through. One of the most spectacular things about human beings is that we can delay gratification. And I don't mean in order to live a miserable existence. I mean, putting in work, knowing that one, three, five years down the road, you know, there's gonna be things available to us that otherwise wouldn't be. That's why one of my favorite conversations was, you know, around my friend Evan saying he hates being asked what his five-year plan looks like. What will life look like, Evan, five years from now? It's like, I don't know, right? I have a direction I'm pointed at, and I'm working every single day to bring that to life, but who knows how many twists and turns life will take? Who knows about the opportunities that will present themselves when they align with my goals and my competencies at a future date? I'm not going to limit myself or deprive myself of those. You build the man, build the woman, hour by hour, day by day, and know that life rewards capable individuals. That means the power is in making yourself more capable. Probably my favorite quote, Nietzsche, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who couldn't hear the music, is about that very idea, right? Trusting that if you build yourself up, you stay focused, 
You take an ax to the tree that is your purpose every day. By the way, to the sound of no applause, to no awards or pats on the back, you will ultimately succeed. Because in doing so, you position yourself to receive opportunities. Opportunities that otherwise would have passed you right by. Sure, they would have been there, but they would have been beyond the scope of what you could handle. Right? That's just the reality. Building oneself up is like an all-access pass to the show that is life. In becoming more, you can see more, you can do more, you can access more. That's why, as the saying goes, it's not about getting what you want. It's about the person you become along the way. Becoming the type of person who can do those things, who is deserving of those things. So when you're frustrated or down, when you're looking around and saying to yourself, you know, there's still a substantial gap here between where I am and where I'd like to be. Know that you showed up, you did the work, you stacked another sheet of paper on that pile. At the time, right, not enough to make a visible difference, but over time, sufficient to stand on, right? You win the day by stacking that sheet and moving forward. You win the day by understanding that you are more capable, more knowledgeable than you were yesterday. You've taken another step forward in positioning yourself to receive those opportunities that will come. If you hang in long enough, they always do. And when they do, you'll think back to all those days of frustration, those seemingly anticlimactic occurrences. And you'll be grateful that you saw it through, that you weren't frustrated or discouraged by the now, but rather saw it as the bridge to infinite opportunity. The other day, I was on a podcast with Evan Carmichael, who's a, a YouTuber and entrepreneur. And we were talking with Shaquille, who was the host, about uh, the mental side of the entrepreneurial journey. How we set goals, uh, but also prepare ourselves for the inevitable adversity associated with growth. And one question Shaquille asked us was, uh, where do we see ourselves in five years? Okay, so... Side note, I have a unique relationship with this question. As someone who was unsure and experimenting with their career, right, for much of their adult life, uh, I never quite knew how to answer it. You know, it's like two things can be true at once. It's a very reasonable question. Uh, but I also uh, didn't like answering it, right? Hated it to my core, you could even say. I could never really articulate why. It just made me uneasy. Right? Like five years is a lifetime. How am I supposed to know? And again, no knock on the host at all. It's a very uh, common and practical question. I'm, I'm glad he asked it because it uh, opened the door to a pretty cool conversation. So anyway, he asked the question and uh, I'm thinking, oh man, like how am I going to approach this? And before I said a word, Evan blurts out, look, if you know exactly what you're going to be doing in five years, you're thinking too small. And that comment, to say it made me happy was an understatement. It was like, thank you for saying what my mind has been trying to piece together for a decade and a half. You know, if you know exactly where you're going to be, of course you're limiting yourself. There's just too much predictability, too much routine process and not enough experimentation, not enough life. Why? Because growth is unpredictable takes us places we didn't expect, shows us things we didn't anticipate, it unveils truths and minor miracles about ourselves that we, let's face it, never would have seen had we been dismissive of all life's variability and opportunity. Now, does this mean we don't move with conviction in a general direction? Does it mean we don't have goals or ambitions? No, I certainly don't think it does. 
Right? You can't hit targets you don't aim for. That will always be true. It merely means life is not about being perfect in bringing about a particular result. It's about making adjustments throughout your pursuit of meaning. If you feel closer to your purpose when you change the medium, then change the medium. If it means, you know, your heart tells you left is where the value lies and not right, then go left, right? To me, it's essentially reminding us that life is not a black and white, yes or no checklist or test. It's a game and you have to grant yourself the freedom to play. You have to give yourself permission to grow. I think about how much time five years is. And how five years ago, I wasn't even thinking about creating media the way I do now with the amazing team of people uh, that helped me. Uh, I wasn't speaking on stages. I hadn't crafted my creative style. I didn't know uh, the people I know now who introduced me to not only new people, but new ideas. These are characters, they're stories, they're opportunities that present themselves only as you immerse yourself in the journey. And I was okay not knowing exactly but merely moving towards a general direction. The most important decisions were, uh, you know, looking back, not what I said yes to, but what I said no to. As I moved through life experimenting, learning, growing, I was able to craft something that worked for me, not other people, not what's in books. There's no roadmap. No, it's an experiment. And this is more of the reassurance I would have wanted during those years from an older version of myself. Like, it's okay to not know exactly where you'll be. Just promise yourself this. If it matters to you, you'll find a way to move to it, with it, towards it. And if it doesn't, then let it go. Surround yourself with people that lift you up. And if they don't, let them go. You'll hear a lot of talk about the right way to do things, especially in this information age. Those ideas and decisions may have in fact been right, but they also may be wrong for you. Try, test it out, and if not, let it go. The experiment that is your life is the reward. It's a luxury. It's such a beautiful ride. You know, don't box yourself in because of some made up theoretical plan. Don't avoid the path to a new world because ah, I checked my list and this doesn't line up with where I said I'll be February 23rd, 2028. Nah, go live your life. Do your best to exist in that place, the intersection of what you love and what adds value. Let it bend, let it transform, let it teach you things about yourself and the world. There aren't correct ways to live, but I think there certainly are some wrong ways. And that's time spent out of obligation, adhering to a story that means nothing to you. Push. See what life gives back. Your footsteps in the aggregate will reveal truths and tell stories you could never have even dreamed up. It's in going that your book is written. And just a friendly reminder, people don't read books for the last page, the ending. No, they read them for that stuff in the middle, right? The journey. So next time I'm asked what my five-year plan is, I'll probably say same as my 10, 20, and 30-year plan. I don't know. But I can tell you, I won't lose sight of that North Star, the one that calls my name. But at the same time, I won't be afraid to wander into the night, dance in the moonlight, even get lost in the shadows from time to time. Growth is directly correlated to one's willingness to push forward into the dark. And well, into that darkness.
We shall go.